So I'm going to talk about uh, search and rescue dogs. It's kind of like a one-on-one -on -one crash course. In high school, this is my dog, Calvin, and we started doing Argus Canine Search and Rescue. We only did it for like a year, and then we stopped because the commitment was too much for us. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what I learned in that year that I was there with them. Um, so there's three different job categories that you can do with Argus, at least. There's a lot of different organizations that do canine search and rescue, and they vary per each one. So the one that I worked with had three sections that you could do, and you had to have them predetermined with the dog that you owned. And so the first is um, what Calvin was, which is an air scenting dog. So they search for any human scent that they could find in the area. So this is typically used for like wooded areas if a child's lost. Um, there's a picture of it right here where this old man's like in an emergency because he has a blanket around him. Um, so the dog is simply looking for human scent in the area. Then there's a tracking where they're looking for a particular scent of a human. So that's kind of like this briefcase. If they dropped that and then they went and disappeared, they would get the scent off the briefcase or like a glove and then they would go find the human that matches the scent. Um, and then the last one is the human remains. Um, and these dogs look for parts. Um, so things like teeth or if something else um, like a skeleton of any sort. And that would be sort of the natural disaster type situations where you're not going to think that they're going to be alive. So you don't want a dog looking for human scent. You want them to be looking for remains scents. Okay, now, can a dog do all three or do you have to track? I mean, you know. You train them for one. One, because that's what I always thought that when these dogs are trained, they, like, you focus in on one talent. Yeah, when we practiced, all the dogs would stay in the vehicles and they'd come out one at a time. And so you would have to switch the entire practice based on which dog was out. And so each dog can only pick one area. Yeah, um, air scenting is the most common. Just looking for human scent in general is the most common for our team at least. So if your dog makes the cut, um, a couple of just kind of criteria in general for what you're looking for in a, a search and rescue dog um, is an overall excellent health. You don't want reoccurring sickness or injuries. If they have a health issue, it might not work well because you need them to be ready whenever um, anything happens. Um, disabilities, you don't want them to be disabled in any part, so you want a strong sense of smell, a strong eyesight, and a strong hearing ability. Um, they need to be able to smell, they need to be able to see, and then they need to be able to hear you when you call them. Um, there's a lot of commands associated with search and rescue for them. And then their athletic ability, they're running for a long period of time, so they need to have a high stamina to be able to run and not wear down fast, because if they get tired and there's someone out there, you need them to be able to keep going. Um, and people say that uh, rescue dogs from like Animal shelters work really well. Calvin's a rescue dog, and almost every dog on our team is a rescue dog, except for like three. And so it's just kind of cool that you get them from this rescue and then you give them a purpose. Um, so I have a video in a second that'll show you about a rescue dog and how you train them. Um, so starting to train, some basic commands are needed. If they know them before they come, it's the best, because it's hard to teach them on site because there's so much other stuff going on. So things like sit, stay, heal, leave it, and come. Um, some of the biggest ones for air scenting dogs are leave it and come um, because if they're trying to pick up a scent but you don't want them to pick up that scent, they have to be able to leave it and go to something else. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest ones that we try to emphasize for them. Uh, toy drive and food drive is a, something that is um, very search and rescue specific because it's used as their reward. So when they find a person when during practice or in a real situation, they get to play afterwards or they get a certain food that they wouldn't get otherwise. So it has to be something special that they usually don't get. Um, and so if your dog doesn't have this, it's a problem. Calvin doesn't have it, which was what our struggle was, is because he doesn't like toys. Um, he was abused with toys before we got him. And so it was like a big struggle because we could only find certain toys that he wouldn't shy away from. So that's a big, um, having the reward is a big aspect of having a search and rescue dog. Puppy circles is what you do in the very first couple of practices. Um, you want them to enjoy coming to practice. You don't want them to get scared like they do if they're going to the vet or to a dental anything. So you just want to make sure that they're okay with practices and that they're comfortable with what they're about to do. And as well, practice makes perfect. So you always start dogs out on leashes and eventually get them off leash. So Calvin always started out on a really long leash. It was 20 to 30 feet. And when he would run, I would just run behind him. Um, so it made sure that if he didn't listen to the leave it statement, I could still like hold him and he wouldn't just be gone. Um, and then eventually they go off leash and you just they just respond to your commands as you go. Now before you move on, tell me about Kelvin's breed background. Do you know anything about his background? So we got him from an Indianapolis shelter as a res as a last day rescue. Um, they think he's well, a Rottweiler. Last day, what does that mean? They were about to euthanize him, so it was like his last day on the line. So he was four when we got him. Um, we got him when I was a freshman in high school, so about eight years ago. 
Um, he was proposed as being a Rottweiler Mastiff mix. I think he looks like it. We have a DNA test that I turned in today, so we'll find out if he actually is a Rottweiler Mastiff. That's right. we're gonna do but yeah, this is the dog that we're doing. Okay. Um, and his history, all that they could tell us was that he came from an abused household that used toys to hurt him. And so like, he was really afraid of toys and didn't like playing. So it was a little rough. Uh, but he kind of plays now, so he's gotten better. Um, I don't know if Search and Rescue helped him, but <laughs> so it was... So he's how old right now then? Are you saying 8? 8 plus 4, 12-ish. Did you say okay? He's getting 12. pretty old, okay. yeah. Okay. He was 4 when we got him. Great. So that's him. Okay. Um, special care for Search and Rescue dogs. That's what SAR means, Search and Rescue. Um, grooming regularly. They need to be bathed and checked for parasites or debris a lot. Since they're out in practices, even our practice zones aren't technically um, clean. We use old warehouses or abandoned areas like buildings to try to get them used to situations because you don't want them in nice clear fields all day and then throw them into an abandoned building one day. Um, so we use the situations that they usually be in so we always have to make sure that they're bathed correctly afterwards to prevent infections um, and their nails being trimmed is really critical especially for dogs that are going to be in natural disaster areas so they don't get caught or break off or anything in certain areas. Um, evaluations are very regular at least after every practice sometimes in between if they go through a really hectic area such as um, just health checks, make sure they're, they're okay, their breathing is normal for after running so much. Um, looking for foreign objects, maybe stuck in their paws or if they mess with their mouth at all, making sure nothing got in their mouths. And then making sure that they're ready to go, um, setting a routine for them, so feeding them at the same time, walking them at the same time, but also breaking it up sometimes so they understand that they don't have to have that happen. <clears throat> Because um, sometimes if a dog gets fed at 8 o'clock every single day and then there's a rescue at 8 o'clock and they're not fed, they won't work. And so it's good to have a routine, but with these dogs you have to break up their routine and make them understand that they have to work no matter what time it is. Um, and then just kind of having all their gear packed and ready to go at all times so you can just grab them and go. Um, and you don't have to spend time trying to find anything. And then I'll play this video really quick. Um, it's just kind of an intro to what they did with these. These are all rescue dogs. Um, and so it's just a little bit of some of the courses and what you do with them. So this is just getting their toy drive up um, and playing with them and letting them be happy. This is one of the situations, so this would be a practice. Um, and so someone's hiding somewhere in the course and their, their goal is to find the person hiding. <coughs> and then teaching them to go under wow. uneven obstacles. <coughs> It does take a certain temperament of a dog to do this job, and so you kind of have to give them a little bit of a try, and then if it doesn't work out, stop. Um, this will show you a lot of the toy drive. So she stuck his toy out the hole, and now he gets to play. <laughs> so that's how, that's how that usually works for them. So on the team, we took turns. If our dog wasn't the one being trained at the moment, we were the ones hiding. Um, so you'd go sit in a forest for like 20 minutes by yourself in the dark and wait for a dog to come find you, which is interesting. <laughs> But yeah, this is it's a really long video of them just like teaching the dogs. Mm -hmm. but. So you said you did it for a year? We did it for a year. I also wasn't 18, so I couldn't go on any searches or do anything like major. I could only practice. And so then by the end, I was going to college and turning 18, so we just stopped. Okay. So, yeah. Is it all on a volunteer basis? It is a volunteer basis. Um, directors sometimes are paid, but more or less it's volunteer because no one pays for you to search for them. So it's just kind of a... Uh, volunteer your time and those kinds of things. So, Other questions? Our entire team was volunteer. No, okay, so you did it a year. Like, how long do you have to do it to get, like, really proficient in this searching? How long? Um, it depends on the dog. Okay. My friends, I had a, a kind of like a teacher in high school, and they picked a dog for this job. So they actually bought it from a breeder, and they looked for specific traits in the dog, and then purchased a dog to do search and rescue. After a year, they were sent out on the Lauren Spear uh, oh, case. Really? Our team looked for her a lot because it's, it's located in Bloomington. Okay. Um, and then that dog is, I think it's been in there three years, and it goes on searches like a couple every couple weeks. Yeah. So um, about a year usually, I would say, is when they typically start getting pretty Can proficient in their job. Ready. Humans remains dogs, I think, take a little longer. So you have to get them used to trying to find Now is that also like, called a cadaver dog? Is that